Capital Report is a production of Senate Media Services. On this week's program, we talk with lawmakers from both parties about efforts underway to make college more affordable and successful for students. Plus, Shannon Lurkey shows us one of the more interesting features of our beautiful state capitol. Stay tuned for this and more on this week's Capitol Report. Welcome to this week's program. I'm Steve Senek. Obtaining a good education is often considered the great equalizer. It helps individuals secure a promising future. This year, policymakers have been working on ways to make college more affordable and preparing students for the jobs of tomorrow. At a recent Senate Finance Committee, lawmakers focused on the cost of today's education. Members, students were at the center of every decision we made in this bill. The bill holds the line on cost increases at a time when student debt runs the risk of crippling our next generation. Through targeted investments and by asking our, higher ed our public higher education systems to hold the line on tuition increases, we're able to help more students access and afford college. By targeting funding to students entering in-demand fields and incentivizing campuses to work with employers, we are also ensuring that the education our students receive is relevant to the future of the work in Minnesota in every corner of our state. I remember seeing a a study that said 1968, if you were a full-time student at the U of M, you could work in a minimum wage job at the 1968 minimum wage. You could work six hours a week. And you could pay for all your tuition and fees at the University of Minnesota. By five, six, seven years ago, I saw a similar number said you had to work full-time, not six hours a week, but full-time minimum wage, just to cover tuition and fees. And, and I think it's gotten worse since then. Joining me now in the studio is the chair of the Senate Higher Education Committee, Senator Paul Anderson. Senator, welcome. Thanks, Steve. Glad, glad to be here. <laughs> Let's step back before we start delving into your bill and kind of give us a perspective of where Minnesota's higher education institutions are today. Well, we have incredible institutions in Minnesota from public to private. I mean, you think of the university, which is a flagship land-grant institution. Um, research that leads the world really and then you have the men state system and you have private colleges we are really fortunate for the system we have here but we also have challenges including um, enrollment that's decreasing and also this cost um, uh, that is just overbearing for students I mean we, we have to get our hands around arms around this going forward which is the cost of higher education what about the challenges that students face you mentioned debt what are some of the other challenges they're facing and the yeah. higher education institutions as well? No, I think the, the costs are uh, the real obstacle for a student. The student, you know, we need a workforce right now. We are short in a lot of different areas around the state of Minnesota that really need skilled workforce, need workforce that is trained for the economy of today and tomorrow. But actually, um, when they are going in and they are uh, paying these costs for higher education and coming out so severely in debt, that creates a real obstacle in going forward in buying a house, in, in buying a car, and just living life. A lot of people are living at home with their parents. So these are areas that are challenging. And this is not just Minnesota. This is across the country. You see this in the rising debt of students. But we have to get our arms around this. Let's dive a little bit into yeah. your bill, and I want to read to you something that was released when the Senate Republicans released the budget targets. It said, Senate Republicans will protect students and families by making college affordable with a laser focus on promoting career and technical education through strategic investments. So how does your bill do that? Well, and we do. We do do strategic investments both to the university system and Minn State. But what we also do is we heavily invest in what's called workforce scholarship program. And this is $15 million that um, basically are allocated in $2,500 scholarships to students that are going into high demand fields. So you're talking about uh, manufacturing, IT, healthcare, agriculture, and then this year's bill also adds child care and transportation. So you think of mechanics or, or different things in transportation. These desperately needed areas around the state, but these dollars would go to the technical schools in the regions of Minnesota and then they would allocate. So it's kind of a local control thing that they say, okay, the for River Falls, we need people, you know, focused on this area. Um, down in Winona, we need people focused on this area, and they can allocate those scholarships of need in those areas. Because then, once those those students get out of school, uh, they're they're less in debt and they're ready for a career. 
um, which are good paying jobs in healthcare and all that. So this is a strategic uh, focus on the relevancy of jobs we need today in the That's state. an interesting approach because yeah. that money is going to the institutions and then they're creating yeah. the programs, I, I That's assume. right. And, and it really gets to the students. So this is not a pass through where, where uh, the system is taking money and then allocating it. It is grow going directly and it's also encouraging a real public-private partnership. So uh, Pine, uh, Pine Tech uh, Community College up in, in Pine City is a perfect example of what they've gone out and they've talked to the community, talked to job providers and said, okay, let, now let's partner. So they will allocate a certain amount of money and so now students aren't just getting 2,500, they're getting 3,500 or, or even more in some cases. So we're encouraging within the bill that public-private partnership which will even expand the scholarships more. You're also doing things to help lower income students. I read that you're having, you added about $23.4 million in grants, is that accurate? Yeah, and this is, the, the state grant program is really critical to, to, to low income students. This really allows them to not only attend the university or Minn State, but also the private colleges. What school fits them the best? And so this is really important to increase the, the uh, eligibility for that. You originally introduced a bill that froze tuition increases at the University of Minnesota and Minnesota State. But you changed that approach. Yep. I think your bill now allows about 2% a year. That's right. And so our approach and the conversation during the session was a really robust one. Um, we had some really good discussion about freezing tuition because again, the students are not able to keep up with this rate of increase in higher education. And there just doesn't seem to be a lot of attention, a lot of willpower to really curb these costs. So we talked about a absolute freeze. Um, what we did is we came up with a compromise um, in, in cap it at 2% increase and basically said, okay, we understand there's some inflation costs here, so we don't want to you know, penalize the institutions severely, but again, the students should not be on the receiving end. The governor's proposal, uh, even in his funding levels, without a cap on tuition, is going to raise tuition in the neighborhood of six, six and a half, seven percent. So that's, we just don't believe those costs should be uh, uh, given back to the students. You had an interesting, uh perspective during the Senate Finance Committee this week. Mm -hmm. uh, you kind of gave a, a, an overview of how higher ed has done in relation to the entire state budget. Yeah. Uh, briefly kind of explain that again. It's yeah. not that the le legislators yeah. are not ignoring higher education needs. Right. It's, it's, it's hard to get your head around this, but go back 30 years ago in the 91 budget, so you know, 90-91 budget, we're in the 2021 budget right now, higher education was 14% allocated funding of the total general fund spending. Education was about 31%. Healthcare at the time was about 22, 23%. So you go from 54% of those two entities, education and higher education to today, that's about 75%. Higher education in those 30 years goes from 14% to 7%. So we are still increasing the funding to higher education, but we're not keeping up to uh, the rate we used to. And that's d due to all the demands at Health and Human Services that's and K-12 right. and, and right. the other budget areas. Your bill has many interesting provisions, and one thing I want to mention is that you kind of cap the cost of online learning. Yep. Yeah, and this is one of those situations that uh, we had heard from students about this interesting uh, situation where you would think in every kind of, as you approach higher education, there's been this push for 15 years, for sure 10 years, about reducing the cost of higher education, going more on online classes. But what we've come to find out that actually, on average, it, it depends, but between $90 and $170 it is it costs more for someone to take an online course compared to an in-person course and so as we ask the questions and ask for justification on why does it cost more to have an online class just it the, the information hasn't been given to us to a point where we say oh yeah that makes sense so we have we have put into the bill an actual uh, uh, cap which says uh, or a freeze to, to, to some extent that says online classes can't cost more than in-person classes and this is this has caused a little bit of a dilemma uh, with the Minn State system because they are saying that this is going to cost them revenue well in the end if we are charging these uh, tuition increases on the backs of students we can't do that before you go I do have to ask you uh, usually by this time of uh, the session every legislative year um, 
we have chosen people to fill the vacancy on the University of Minnesota Board of Regents. That yeah. hasn't happened. What's That's going right. on? Well, it is our constitutional duty for the legislature to choose four regents every two years. So in this year, we're supposed to choose a student regent, uh, a member from uh, CD5, and two at-large uh, regents. And we went through an RCAC process, which is the, the University Alumni Association and 24 total members that uh, recommend members to the Joint Committee, which is the House and Senate. The House and Senate Joint Committee met nine weeks ago now and recommended five people for the four slots. And then what happens is within about a month, maybe six weeks, the full legislature gets together in a joint convention and elects those regents. There is a uh, group in the House that has basically said, We're, we don't like the recommended candidates. We're going to kick it to Governor Walls. And this has been reported and, and quoted, and this is really unfortunate. So the Senate is begging the House to call the joint uh, convention. This needs to be a joint resolution. And so we're actually going to go go ahead and go forward with calling a convention to do this. It is uh, imperative that the incoming president of the University of Minnesota has a full, full functioning uh, a board of Regents. If the governor happens to, in case of basically should be an emergency, because again, this is a constitutional duty of the of the legislature, if the governor appoints, those are two-year terms. And so then in two years, you would have the potential of having eight new Regents in a board of 12. This is the most important governing board in the state of Minnesota, so we got to do our job. Senator Anderson, I want to thank you for your time. Good luck choosing the Regents, and good luck with your bill and getting it through the, the process. Thanks, Steve. At a state capitol press conference, Governor Waltz recently introduced Tarek Tomes as the new state IT director. After the interview I had with Tarek and the opportunity to set in there, I remember thinking, I would like to work for this person. This is somebody who inspires me to a vision. The competency is very clear, and it's someone who's openness to hearing from, uh, from the people who work there and from the constituents and the customers he serves is simply uh, something exactly what we were looking for. The 2300 state IT workers are as devastated as anyone by the very you know, public uh, 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 issues that Minlars has had. And, and we want to make sure that they don't retreat. We want to make sure that they're not afraid to continue to put forth bold solutions. And we have to make sure from a leadership perspective that we have the processes and methodologies in place to support decisions and also protect them. We continue our conversation on meeting the needs of our higher education institutions with Senator Jason Isaacson, who is a communications professor when he's away from the Capitol, and welcome. Thank you for having me. I'm really, really appreciative of the time today. I want to begin by talking about a comment that Senator John Marty said uh, when he was in the Finance Committee yesterday when they were taking up the higher education bill. Mm -hmm. And what he explained to the members was that in 1968, a full-time student could work six hours per week at minimum wage and pay for tuition and fees to attend mm -hmm. the University of Minnesota. Mm -hmm. Today, that same student would have to work full time. You were in the classroom teaching. How bad is it for students? It's, it's remarkable. Uh, the students I have at a community college are all working, almost all of them full time. And uh, their work gets in the way of their studies a lot, particularly because what you're looking at in this situation might be different than when John Marty was saying, Senator Marty, is that I have a lot of students that are coming back you know, they're not their traditional 18-year-olds out of high school. These are people that are in the real world with families and children and responsibilities and, and, and loans and payments. And so uh, it has become an increasing burden for them. And uh, it's almost impossible for them uh, to, to work and pay for school as they go. I have several students that will go for a semester, take a semester off and go for a semester, uh, which just prolongs the process and frankly prolongs their time of getting to the workforce and the job or career that they want. So it's, it's uh, incredibly problematic. Well, the Senate did something in their bill. It's, it, they offered an increase in the grants, uh, $23.4 million. Is that enough? Uh, it's not focused correctly. Uh, I think the grants are important. I think they're a really great tool in the toolbox. I think they provide a lot of relief for folks, especially when you're looking at what I call the middle class donut hole, with uh, beyond just normal grants, but able to get some grants that help maybe some kids whose parents make enough that they don't get a lot of financial aid but they don't have enough money to actually help them go to school. Grants are important. So the threshold's too low? Well, it's, it's, it's not that it's too low. What the problem is is that uh, when you pay for the grant program at the expense of the universities, you're just eating your own tail. 
Uh, the reality is, is that when you up the grants, but you don't fund the universities, and the universities up their tuition, you're just paying for the problem you created by not taking care of the universities in the first place. Your committee, you sit on the Higher Education Committee, mm -hmm. uh, initially considered freezing uh, tuition at mm -hmm. Minnesota State and the University of Minnesota. Now the bill allows generally 2% cost mm -hmm. of living adjustments. Mm -hmm. Your opinion about that in small increase? Well, I love the idea of freezing tuition if we pay for it, right? Uh, well, the problem is, is that their bill originally froze tuition and then also froze funding. It's actually a cut. And so what you really did is on the front end, it looks like you're doing the students a favor, but what you're actually doing is reducing the quality of the education by reducing the amount of money they have to spend just from last biennium, right? And so if a pencil costs 10 cents two years ago and costs 12 cents now, and you only give them 11 cents, you haven't actually increased funding. And that's pretty much the problem the Republicans are faced with when you look at their budget, not just in higher ed, but across the board. And so uh, the grant program's okay, but if we don't take the responsibility as a state to fund our higher education institutions, they're not gonna be the quality we want them to be. Right? And that's and that's really begets a lot of the things we have in Minnesota that we take for granted. Isn't it fair to say, though, that lawmakers are paying more attention to higher education needs? I, I know that the Senate, in generally, over the forecasted needs, uh, is proposing about $100 million more dollars. The governor would like it's to see It's actually about, about $38 million shortfall. Above the forecast? No. Uh, why, how do you come up well, with the Well, the problem is, is that we don't, for reasons I'll never understand, we don't include inflation in our budgets. Right? So if you come up with $100 million in last time, but inflation increases your expenditures by $138 million, did you give them an increase? That's the question. On one level you did, because it's in real dollars, like there's a dollar here, now there's a dollar amount here. But in terms of buying power of what they can buy with the money, that's actually less. And so th that's part of the problem we have in explaining and why our, our budgeting system seems not to be transparent, is that when you don't include inflation, and then you come out and say you're giving more money, and you throw out big numbers that sound like a lot, because it's, sometimes it's the citizen's first time hearing it, they're not getting the full picture. Uh, if we want our universities to compete, we have to at least keep up with inflation, something we failed to do biennium after biennium. The one aspect of the Senate bill is that it directs funding to local technical colleges. Mm -hmm. And those, then the communities can decide, you know, or the colleges can decide where it's best to invest that money so they can get students into jobs that may be opening mm -hmm. in that community. Good approach. Yeah, I uh, actually did that for four years in the House. Uh, where my, both terms of mine that I had in the House, I did that exact thing where I went in and I, and I helped the, the schools find a way to make them much more flexible than usual by paying for the professor outright rather than doing it by credit, giving the professor the freedom to meet into the, the labor market and the job market in their area and find a way to meet the demands to help those businesses, especially small businesses who I focused on, to become successful. So I think that can be a really productive approach, especially when you look at understanding that Minnesota is a nuanced regional labor markets all over the place with different approaches. Up in my area, we have three of the biggest Fortune 500 uh, um, medical device manufacturing companies. Up north near, uh, what is it, uh, uh, is it Staples up there where they have uh, uh, some of the biggest CNC machinery operations there. And so meeting the needs of those areas is important and giving them that flexibility is really important. And that's the future of education, shaping education to fill vacancies. It has to be, at least in the, in the career technical community college approach, that's one way we can make them very viable and an integral part of our economy. There's an interesting provision, and I, and I believe this was uh, authored by Senator Cohen, the, the former Senate Finance mm -hmm. Chair, called College Possible. Mm -hmm. it was, it's designed to help low-income students graduate through more coaching and support. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Your thoughts on that approach? I think those approaches are really important as a part of a bigger picture. I mean, by themselves, they're obviously not going to solve the problem. But, you know, what we're slowly beginning to realize, and I think teachers have known this for a long time, and it's been difficult to get... Uh, administration and and the state to understand is that our our philosophy of teaching in the past has been difficult and hard for students because it's a kind of a one-size-fits-all model we want you here and we're gonna bring you here and the reality is is that a teacher's job and what I do every day in the classroom is I find where you are no matter what level you're at I reach you where you are and I bring you to where you need to be and that's the responsibility of the teacher and so programs like College Possible do exactly that because uh, a, a freshman in high school uh, that's lived in the Mounds View system, for example, which is one of the highest rating programs, uh, uh, school districts in the state, is going to be at a much different point than the average freshman in the school district that's much lower rated. And so giving those folks the chance to make up what they're missing or catch up and get to the point where they need to be to be college prep and ready to go is so important. If you were chairing the Senate Higher Education Committee, mm -hmm. what would you do differently? You're in the classroom, you see, you know, you live this life. Right. What would you do differently? 
I think that we'd have to ask some serious questions. You know, I have some ideas. You know, I think that we're going to have to move towards, uh, if, we're, if the work shortage continues, uh, looking at, at making two-year colleges a, a part of a package that doesn't cost a lot of money, especially if you make under a certain amount, maybe even free. Um, I feel like it's important that we take a look at uh, uh, access and affordability. And so uh, that part of it is something that we can do in the legislature if we make that a priority and I have to message that. The other thing I would do is I would go down to that level and I'd get into the lowest level of administration and the professors and I'd ask them, what are you missing? What do you need? What can we do to make this better? And I think universally what I'm hearing is that we need more folks that are either guidance counselor or mental health counselors because the number one thing I spend outside of the classroom doing besides being a teacher is being a career counselor. I am helping them focus and get where they need to go because the schools just don't have the resources to give them what they need. And the folks that are there managing so many people it's hard to be individualized, where I have the luxury of having been with them all semester and developing a relationship, so I have an idea of where they're at. So when they ask me questions, there's a deeper understanding there. We just haven't provided the funding for school counseling, career counseling, and psychological counseling, which obviously I'm not qualified to do, nor do I do, to provide that option. And so we need, if I was spending money on anything, that's one area I would invest in, along with uh, trying to switch the, the tide back to where the state used to manage 60 to 70 percent of the cost and the students was 30 to 40 and that switched, I would work really hard to bring that back. Quickly, before you go, I do have to ask about the filling the vacancies in the University of Minnesota Board of Regents. Usually that's done by this part of the, mm -hmm. the session. Um, can we move the ball forward? Is I that think the ball is going to move forward. I think this is an example of some posturing by my friends across the aisle to try to give somebody a black eye. The session isn't done. We've got four weeks left, well within the margin by which we can sit down and talk about this. It's a negotiation process. It's been a long process. I think it has gone a little longer. What's holding than, it up? I think there's some disagreement about where votes want to be, right? Uh, you have 107 Democrats. I think it's like 100 or 99 Republicans. And so uh, the Democrats want to control the process, much like the Republicans have in the past when they've been in charge. And it's just coming to some agreement on who we want to have, right? So I think that's it. Senator Isaacson, it's always very nice to have you. Thank you for having me. Thanks for coming. You bet. Have a great day. Finally, on this week's program, Shannon Lurkey talks with Brian Pease of the Minnesota Historical Society about one of the state capitol's more interesting features. One of the many areas in the state capitol that is filled with beautiful artwork is the Senate chamber. There's two very large murals overlooking Senate proceedings. How did they come to be here? Well, that was all part of the original vision of Cass Gilbert, the architect of the state capitol. When you walk through the building, He's always, as he was planning the, the design and the, and the shape of the spaces, he was always incorporating art and architecture together. So he would design a room where he would put the notable architectural features, but also create space for art. So you have this beautiful classical architecture, but you have paintings that tell you stories about the state or whatever building you're, you're telling, telling the stories of that state or that building's history. So that's what was happening in this space. These are two large murals that really talk about important events or kind of how we became a state we were in 1900 when this building was being built. The mural on the north wall it depicts the headwaters of the Mississippi. Can you tell us more about that? Yeah, that's called the, the discoverers and civilizers led to the source of the Mississippi River. So the figures on, on one side are those explorers, going all the way back to the French explorers, to the people who eventually did find that source of the Mississippi River in 1832. And the other side has the people once that land and, and so forth, that source was discovered, people are being shown moving in to that land. And then in the center you have the, the Manitou, uh, the father of waters who was actually pouring, starting the flow of the river from an urn. And then you also have two uh, Indian people represented there. And one is kind of in a defensive position because, because of the European influence, things are going to be changing for them and for their people. But once again, you're looking at the building from the eyes of the builders of this building in 1900. So the Mississippi River, that was the lifeblood for the entire state's history. You had cities built there, you had the waterfalls on St. Anthony that was generating the water power for the flour mills. And so that, that river was a vital part and still is a vital part of our, our history. And the mural on the south wall brings in uh, the patriotism of Minnesota and Minnesota's agriculture. Can you talk more about that? Right, that's also a very interesting depiction because it's talking about uh, not only the agricultural history, but it throws in the state's patriotism. So on the far right side, it has 
Civil War soldiers. So that represents our willingness to volunteer to fight in that Civil War. And then in the center has an oxen that's pour, pulling a large cart with all the produce, all the products that we can generate as an agricultural state. And then the families, the people, the farmers that are coming in to use that land to make a, a very prosperous state. And what's really, uh, really neat about those depictions is there's also kind of a, uh, Edwin Blashwell, the artist, is telling a little bit of a time warp or time change because you see with those Civil War soldiers, you'll see the younger soldiers in the foreground and in between the cart and the other soldiers on the far right are the old veterans. So now you've had this time from 1861 to 1905 where the, those soldiers now are the gray-bearded veterans that are coming back to the state capitol. And there's something important hidden in plain sight. Can you tell us about that? Sure, yeah. One of the things that Evan Blashfield, the artist, wanted to do is to recognize uh, Cass Gilbert, who was the architect of the building, and then Channing Seabury, who was the vice president of the Capitol Building Commission, pretty much the head official for that whole process. And so he said in, in the Renaissance time, an artist would often you know, only be successful because he had a patron to help him you know, support his career and help do the work uh, that you know, the patron wanted to be done. So as a consideration for that support, those artists of the Renaissance would often put a, their patron's face or their features in, into a painting. And so in a sense, it's a thank you it's for a, the commission. Yeah, it, it's a recognition for the work that these two men did to make this building happen. And so those are found at the far left side of the, the painting that uh, kind of behind one of those uh, classical figures, you can see the profiles of those two important figures. The artist Edwin Blashfield came to Minnesota for the installation of these paintings, and then they stood relatively untouched, I understand, until 1988 with the first restoration effort, and then they were restored again for the grand reopening of the Capitol. Can you talk about those restoration efforts? Sure. The whole uh, history of these paintings has kind of been clouded in, in you know, just a few obscure references to some work that might have been done in the 30s. Uh, there's some photos of them bringing an artist or even people to clean the murals of the dust and the grime. and if you think back in 1900, 1905, 1910, 1920, they're burning coal. So you're going to have this fine sooty layer that's going to be on all the surfaces. We discovered a lot of the paintings, not only in the Senate chamber, but all over the building, had sections of them overpainted. So in the 30s, they brought in artists to probably give them an employment or the some Part jobs. of the works project. Right. So they would be employed, you know, give them some work to do, and then they subtly changed colors, they added things to the paintings, the compositions are still the same. And so once again, that's something you can't see until you actually go and physically investigate that. So in 88, they were cleaned, they um, had a conservator come in and cleaned off the old varnish and the dirt and the grime. And then when we had this last project, we had the conservators actually go back and remove the non-original paint. So the new paint was chipped away with knitting needles and bone folders, anything with a sharp tip or whatever the conservator preferred, they inch by inch chipped away all the non-original paint to get back to the original colors. And what we see today is really a reflection of what Edwin Blashfield had wanted for the colors and the designs that we see today. Join Shannon next week as she delves into more topics affecting Minnesotans. I'm Steve Senek, and on behalf of all of us at Senate Media Services, thank you for watching.